Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. I'm your host, Nicole, and today we're joined by Vahey with Falcon Force, and today we're going to be talking about falconry and uh, his falcon abatement company. So, hey, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. So, um, this is a a topic that I'm especially passionate about, Um, certainly not as experienced as you are, but falconry, you know, it's something that I don't know that a lot of people have heard of, or maybe people that have seen it in movies or medieval textbooks don't realize that it's still alive and well in today's society. So maybe we could just start by um, talking about your company, Falcon Force, and then kind of dive into what falconry is. Fantastic. Um, Falconry goes back to 4,500 years of um, history where before gunpowder was invented, mankind tamed down the, uh, used to be the eagle, and then it became the sacred falcon, probably coming from the Altai region of Mongolia, which is ancient China, present-day Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and all that stuff. That's where the the birth of falconry goes back to. Anyway, so uh, before gunpowder was invented, mankind uh, tamed down the uh, the raptors to, in order to put food on the table. And then eventually uh, there were easier means of taking game with the aid of a gun or, you know, archery equipment or whatnot. Therefore, falconry became more of a uh, back burner, a chic sport or pastime of the rich and wealthy and royalty and so on. So here we are 4,500 years later or more, and uh, falconry is still very much alive. It's a very primitive way of hunting and having a symbiotic relationship with a raptor. Uh, We don't put food on the table. The objective is no longer to put food on the table with our raptors, even though someone like myself who lives off the land oftentimes ends up having that relationship with my bird and, you know, consuming some of the prey that is gathered in the process of practicing modern-day falconry. And, and one thing that, uh, a question that I received a lot when I tell people about falconry um, is I think there's a misconception that people are keeping these raptors or, or birds of prey, whether it's a falcon or, or a hawk, um, that they're keeping them as pets. And that's actually not what they're doing and, and actually not legal. So it, this is just a, a sportsmanship way of hunting that could maybe be considered a hobby as well. Yes. I mean, it, it would be conti- for someone like myself, it would be a complete insult to have someone call me a pet keeper. These are not mm-hmm. pets. They are wild animals. They are predators that need to catch. They need to, in order to be in the right mindset, they need to be flown. They need to catch their own game. They need to be fed. Most importantly, they need to be at a wild caught game because nothing captive bred can supplement what their variety of their diet or the quality of their diet uh, coming from the wild may be. So um, there are people who do it. You know, you go to Renaissance fairs and so on, you oftentimes may see a falconer standing there educating people and so on, but that's not the objective of falconry per se. That's just, you know, an individual educating the public, basically. And I think in some of those cases, it might be somebody from like a raptor rehabilitation facility. So that might be a handicapped bird of prey that's not able to survive in the wild. So it now lives in captivity at a facility like that, that is then used as an educational outreach animal. Absolutely. And the best thing for the general public is to to understand these raptors. Not many people get to see them, you know, a couple of three feet, four feet away. And that whole experience in itself, hopefully, um, you know, lights up a fire in, in a child's mind where they want to pursue it from a conservationist point of view and for the for the well-being of the sport and so on. And um, that's what that's what education comes in. And it's extremely important. And I honor that 100 percent. My own personal opinion is I don't know how you could have that experience and not be inspired. It's really, it's really magical. And and I think it's um, just, it's something that I really just am passionate about, even though, unfortunately, I don't have a bird myself right now. Um, How did you get into falconry? Uh, It's a long story, but basically I was seven years old. My brother and I went to a juice booth. This was overseas. We went to a, uh, I'm sorry, we went went to a public swimming pool. And on the way back, we uh, stopped at this corner of the street sort of freestanding juice booth and when our turn came to uh, place our order my brother noticed that he was four years older than me noticed that there was a Eurasian kestrel sitting on a block right next to the juicer (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so we asked the guy if it was for sale, and sure enough, it was. But we oh didn't have goodness. that kind of money on us, even though it wasn't outrageous. But so we paid a down down payment, took the bus, went home, grabbed money, took the bus, came back, paid the guy, and he put it in a paper bag, oh, and gosh. we took you know put the take, took the bus, went home, and of course we got there and we unveiled this thing, and it was the coolest thing we've <laughs> ever had experienced. Absolutely no idea what falconry was and what equipment or weight management or anything like that was. We just had this cool, cool bird. Ironically, we were just kids enjoying this relationship we had with this bird and we, we made some right choices without knowing. Now that I look back, we'd made, we made the best decisions we could have made for that bird, which is part of the thing was that we, we'd go up on the rooftop and set live traps and get English sparrows to come in and then I you know, would bring him in and my brother would sit on the couch. Mind you, my parents were very well off and we had Italian top-notch furniture. <laughs> my brother would sit on this couch and hold the bird on a glove and I would take this sparrow and I'd, I'd pull out a couple of primaries so it wasn't 100% capable of <laughs> getting away. And then I'd throw it in the air and this bird would come off and would see there and go, did you see that? Did you see that? <laughs> anyway, it was blood and feather and gore and everything <laughs> hanging from curtain rods that you could imagine. I mean, oh, it, yes. was, it was really bad. Mom would come home and you can't never do this again. Okay, mom. Okay, mom. And sure enough, a couple of days later, we'd do the same thing over and over again. We had this thing for about, I don't know, four or five years. And then um, this bird became very aggressive when it became uh, an adult bird. It was a misprint. Mm -hmm. And um, it would attack any anyone strange guest or whatnot would come to our house. This thing would straight go for their face. So um, we decided that, our, you know, with our parents and so on, we collectively decided that it was no longer safe for us to have this thing. So we went in and traded in for... 14 uh, parakeets that were free flying in our bedroom as if that was any better <laughs> but anyway going back i mean my brother and i bred bred and owned and you know had everything from tropical fish to chameleons to snakes to rhesus monkeys i mean we've had uh -huh. a ton of animals so it was just another amazing experience we've had and then um i i came here in the u.s in may of 1988 uh, as a 13 year old child it was a time frame where I was detached from Falconer. This is before internet, of course, and before cell phones and all that good stuff. And um, then in my tail end of my high school years and early part of my college years, I started field trialing German short-haired pointers. Mm -hmm. So I was at a field trial. Um, now, mind you, at the end of um, hunting regulation booklets here in California at the time, there was a section for falconry. But how would how would someone like me come across a falconer? <laughs> right. But anyway, so I was um, I was at a field trial in California City, uh, California, and we're standing by the bonfire one evening, and I overheard a conversation between two field trialers, colleagues of mine, and one of them said, uh, Joe's famous dog, Golden Tooth, got bought by a wealthy fal falconer, and I just about spasmed, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, make a long story short, I, uh, I, asked, I asked them who this guy was, and they said they didn't know who the guy was, but he was a veterinarian out of Ridgecrest, California. So back at the time, I was a navid fly fisherman. So next mm -hmm. time I was going to the Eastern Sierras, I pulled up to the entrance to Ridgecrest, California. There was a phone booth, and underneath the phone booth was hanging a uh, the yellow pages. And I just it was four a.m. in the morning, and I grabbed that thing and I just ripped the chain off, threw it in the car, and drove to my fly fishing destination. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, after after a morning of fishing at lunchtime, I sat there and I, I should have just torn that one page. I don't know why I, was, I took the whole thing with me. But anyway, so make a long story short, I went down the list and by the time from a pay phone, by the time I called the fourth veterinarian office, they said, oh, that's not us. That's Jeff Novak at Rosemont Animal Hospital. Anyway, so I called him and of course I was at a payphone. I didn't have a way for him to call me back and they wouldn't put me in touch with him. But they said, we'll take the number down and he's in surgery when he comes down. When he comes out, he'll call you back. So about an hour later, in frigid cold, you know, temperatures out there standing next to the phone booth, finally he called back and we touched base. And my background is photography. At the time I was studying photography at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. And uh, um, immediately the the, the interest of possibly doing a book project on falconry, which was a very familiar world to me, uh, came to my mind. And so I started that approach. And sure enough, I photographed him the following week. I went back and photographed him. And then I asked him, I said, are there any other falconers in the U.S.? He says, oh, yeah, just in California, there's 740 falconers. And we're meeting at, uh, a double, at the Double Tree Inn Hotel in Bakersfield. So anyway, that's how it started. I went there. And sure enough, there were hundreds of birds sitting at the lawn, the weathering yard that was set up. And 
then I just got suckered right back into falconry, as you can imagine. And it's been a very well journey. And I've, I could say comfortably that I've ruined my life for the sport. <laughs> and if I could do it again, I would find way. I, I wish I had ways to discover falconry when I came to the U.S. at an earlier age, because there was about six or seven years that I was detached from it. And so now fast forward to today and you're still flying and now you have actually made a business out of your falconry with the Falcon Abatement? Yes. In 2010, as I said, I'm a photographer. I did commercial advertising work here. I had a studio in Los Angeles. And in 2010, I decided that I was, that that career was after 14 years of photography, I was done with that career. And I wanted to try something that was closer to my heart, closer to my passion. So I closed up the studio and so on. And I started Falcon Force. First, Two years, I was subcontracting under uh, under another company, and then by the third year, I got my own offers and my own contracts going. And the following year, I had um, a large theme park in San Diego. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to name them, but Sea World. Uh, in any event, um, to this day, now it came from a one man show in 2010. Here we are, almost 10 years later. A uh, company has 26 falconers currently working with us. We're spread between eight states. Anyway, so it's been an incredible journey and, you know, the dream of my life. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, it's always so inspiring to hear people that have been able to take things that they're so passionate about and turn it into a way to be sufficient and, and create an income. Absolutely. That's what it's all about. And I assume this is a term that maybe some of our listeners haven't heard of before. So can you tell us a little bit more about what falcon abatement is? Falcon-based bird abatement is using practical predator-prey relationship to protect, uh, in our case, we do blueberries, cherries, wine grapes. We do theme parks, resorts, golf courses, industrial sites, whatever it may be, marinas, airport bases, or air force bases, um, military bases, whatever it may be. So our birds, our trained birds, are pursuing the species that are causing the problem, normally chasing them out and then breaking off, coming back to get rewarded for it. It's a sustainable, very, very green and clean way of doing bird uh, bird abatement. And uh, usually nothing gets hurt. It's just a matter of presence of that raptor um, and the way the prey species are genetically wired biologically wired to deter a, a predator species like that. And, and and that relationship has been, you know, there's multiple uh, abatement companies currently rising in every part of the country or the world, I should say, nowadays. But it's not a very old industry. It's um, I think it started probably, I would say, in about 25 years ago, it started becoming a curiosity. And now it's a very positive and to the public's eye, it's very positive. It's nothing gets hurt. It's just hazing using a predator against a prey species that causes harm, but whether it's financial health hazard or whatever it may be, liability in an airport or whatnot. So this is probably taking a bit of a sidestep um, and just kind of talking about the, the general overview of falconry. But I guess for my, my own curiosity, let's say you're working something like say the, the blueberry field. So mm -hmm. obviously you're going to have um, the, the problem birds that are wanting to stay there because there's a food source. How, if you're chasing them off with one of your raptors, how does that um, discourage the birds from just flying around and then coming back? Like how long does it take for them? Do you, do you ever like fully scare off these birds for long periods of time? Or is this something that you have to go out and fly the fields regularly? I guess I just don't understand Yes, let me explain that. So the way it works out is as the the, the prey species, which are generally speaking uh, English starlings, who are, which are basically non-native to this continent. They were introduced here back in 1800s as a wedding release and uh, they have taken over the continent. Um, or it could be American robins uh, at a lesser quantity or whatnot. But the way it works out is as they're not attracted to green fruit, as the fruit starts ripening, it's the sugar that they're, they're attracted to. So they will come in in big, large flocks. Sometimes starlings could be coming in at flocks of 2,000 birds, and they could decimate a 100-acre uh, blueberry field in a matter of three or four days. And I'm talking about a complete loss. So the way it works out is each of us uh, assigned a field will be there from the beginning to the end. As the, as the blueberries start blushing, changing color, they go from red to you know deep blue and then almost purple before they're harvested. And so we're there basically from the very beginning to all the way to the end where the fruit is harvested safely and 
gone. Uh, in the case of wine grapes, um, similar situation. We're there normally 12 hours a day. Each person is assigned. I can cover up to um, 1,000 acres, 1,500 acres even with my team of six birds. So I show up first thing in the morning before sun up and I'm on, parked on a hilltop and I'm watching. And, um, you know, minutes later, half hour later, a group of birds will come in and I'll cut, a, I'll, I'll cut one of my birds loose. And that bird will chase that flock out and they as long as they stay above the falcon, they are safe. So they will go higher and higher and higher before they disintegrate into the oblivion, um, going in different directions. And so then my birds call down, and that bird's fed a small ration, and that bird's on the goes on the back burner. And uh, if the next flock comes in half hour later, another bird will go, you know, chasing them. So it's just a, an ongoing chase. In the event of a crop situation because you have an inherent problem and that is the attraction to the food that you have there. It is an ongoing problem. But if in places like golf courses, for example, we have migratory birds that will come and want to use a pond as a as a refuge. And if you put the pressure on them for a few consecutive days, then those birds will start thinning out. So there is there is a win win situation and there's also that which we continuously put the pressure on them until the fruit is taken safely. Thank you for explaining that. I've always been been curious about that. So what kind of birds do you fly currently? Um, currently for abatement work, I'm, I'm guessing you're asking about abatement birds? Um, both. Okay, for abatement birds, normally I use male long wings, in other words, falconide. Mm -hmm. And they could be anywhere between uh, male peregrine falcons, male Barbary falcons, male red nape shaheens, um, or hybrids of all of the above. Some, some people use Aplomato falcons. I used mm -hmm. to have about 12 of them. Not, I no longer own any. Um, so that's primarily, you want small horses for courses, as they say. <laughs> you want small birds that will be the proper sized raptor chasing a prey species. Mm -hmm. um, let's say I was doing a landfill and the problem is seagulls. Those smaller birds are not going to be effective. So you want to step it up to female raptors, okay. female peregrines, female red nape shaheens, saker falcons, and so on. And let me explain something here. The, the, all, in all raptor species, the females are a third larger than the males. So that's why when I say the males are smaller, just so the audience understands where we're coming from. Sure. And what do you um, play personally? Personally, I hunt with uh, jir peregrine hybrids, uh, which is, the, as you know, the peregrine falcon is the fastest bird on the face of this planet. Uh, they can stoop up to 240 miles an hour. The jir falcon comes from the northern hemisphere, and they are the most powerful and the largest of the falconide, uh, tail chasing ptarmigan on the tundra. I mean, that's their that's their strong point. Mm -hmm. So artificially inseminated jir peregrine hybrids are made, and they are the Ferrari of falconry, basically Ferrari of falconry birds. Yeah, they're like designer falcons. Yes, <laughs> and uh, they are they're like mules. They they are hardworking birds. They're extremely aerial, and um, extremely powerful birds. That's what I like to fly when I'm hunting my birds. You're giving me butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> nah. Trust me, every time I handle my own birds, I get butterflies. <laughs> I bet. So let's say that maybe um, some of our listeners are starting to get little butterflies in their stomach too. So stateside, it's not quite so easy as picking up a bird at the juice stand and taking it home in a bag. <laughs> Yeah. What are some of the steps that uh, somebody would need to take to get involved in falconry? Absolutely. So depending on what state you're in, the best step is to call your state um, fish and game office and ask them if there is a falconry organization that is active in that state. In most states, falconry is legal. I think there's one or two states that it may not be. But once you call the, the falconry association, then they can, you can introduce yourself and start the process by hopefully meeting some of the members, and or most clubs will have an apprentice chairman, and they will be able to help you through the process. But the process is not difficult in any ways, but it, it is a process that needs to be followed very strictly. It's um, lo lots of restrictions and, and rules and regulations on that, um, and rightfully, because not everyone should be able to put their hands on a bird and keep it as a pet. So the first step would be to get connected with a club but that is important because as a new falconer, as an apprentice falconer, they are going to need a sponsor. Yes. 
I don't know if you wanted to get into that depth, but um, so uh, so when you make that connection, the first step is to go to your local department fish and game office and take a test, a written test for which you you will get a booklet that your club will recommend where to get and so on, and you will do the study guide. Uh, once you're ready, you make an appointment, you go take a test, uh, and with an 80% or better score, you get an approval. The next step is to have a fishing game officer to come and inspect your facility, and that's highly regulated, what measurements are and spacing and so on and so forth. And then after that, you're hopefully with the help of members in your local state club, you'll find yourself a sponsor. Um, there are three stages of licensing in the falconry in the u.s falconry there is apprenticeship which is the first two years general falconer which is the next five years after your apprenticeship and then after your seventh year collectively speaking you become a must master falconer so your sponsor would have to be probably a in most states a general or better and they'll sponsor you for the next two years under their care and guidance you will trap your first bird from the wild and the reasoning behind that is if you should you mismanage your bird and that bird gets lost, that bird reverts back to the wild in a matter of 48 hours. So there's no contamination of gene pool. And then, yeah, for, for the first two years, you have one bird that you will care for. And then once you become a general falconer, you're allowed to have, in most states, two birds. And then once you are a master falconer, you can have unlimited number of birds. And it may differ from state to state. So that's something that your state secretary can answer for you. And that's interesting that you should touch on that because it's admittedly been um, several years since I've been involved in this personally, so that the rules might have changed. But I believe here in Colorado, you can have, of course, the one bird is a general, or I'm sorry, one bird is an apprentice. It can only be a select breed of bird. And then when it's gen, when you're at a general, I believe, and I could be mistaken again, that you can have three birds. And then I thought as a master in Colorado, you could only have five. First, so your apprentice birds are in most states, I think Utah is an exception uh, that I'm aware of, but in most states, your apprentice birds are either American kestrels or um, red-tailed hawks. Those are the two of the most common raptor species in the U.S., and um, that's what primarily most states allow for falconry apprenticeship sort of birds, trapped from the wild, that is. And again, every state is different mm -hmm. and used to be all managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, but... Uh, I think in 2012, that each, each state took the responsibility of managing their own falconry departments. It's still, still under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife jurisdiction because these are migratory birds uh, covered under uh, MBTA, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And uh, so they still have a say in it, but uh, each state has their own sub-say uh, sub in what those numbers are and species and so on. About... Ten years ago, I'd say, without doing the math um, officially, I used to live in Wyoming, which I know is where you live as well. And at that point in time, um, when I was involved in, in falconry there, uh, master level could fly a golden eagle. Is that still applicable in Wyoming? Absolutely, it is. Um, you do need an endorsement for eagles. Um, that means you have to have experience with a large raptor. And each state, again, is different as far as how they spell that out. Uh, in most states, a large raptor means a fruginous hawk, a jeer falcon, mm -hmm. uh, there are set species, great horn owl or whatnot, or eagle experience at a facility like a rehab center and so on. So for two years, you need, you need to have experience handling large raptors. And then you need, I think in general, you need two eagle falconers to endorse you as capable. Really? Um, and then you can get your endorsement and go from there. Yeah, I know for a while, um, and this might have changed too, but Wyoming was one of the only places that you could fly eagles. So I was curious if that was still um, still in the, in the regulations or not. Yes, Wyoming is not the only state you can fly eagles. You can fly eagles in most states that you can practice falconry. Oh, okay. Wyoming was the only, eagle, only state allowing wild-taken eagles on a depredation permit. Oh, okay. uh, Fish and Wildlife would assign you a game warden, and because of areas where lamb are getting slaughtered by predating uh, eagles, they would allow a specific take on an immature bird and you'd go out there with a fishing game warden and you would trap this bird and then it would become a falconry bird. Hopefully that's coming back. I think I think that is in the process of coming. I think this last year, one eagle was taken. There was about 10 years of about no take. And this last year they opened one, if I'm not mistaken, one or two birds were taken out of Wyoming again. Interesting. You know, in this process, you have to have the proper facility for your bird of prey, whatever 
um, you start with. So obviously you're not just putting your hawk in your cage in your back bedroom. So in, in order to be a falconer, you're, you're going to need to be somebody that has at least some land in that a residential backyard is fine, but you can't necessarily be somebody that lives in an apartment or a condo. You have to have an outdoor facility for this bird. But is there any other type of, of folks that falconry would not be a good fit for? You know, there are people who even live in apartments, but as long as you have your you you have a facility in a place where these birds could be exposed to direct sunlight, they could you know they could weather out most of the day and be in a good healthy environment. You could still do it. It's not a matter of you have to have land per se, um, but there are regulations where you put that facility. Your muse, M E W S, that is that's a falconry term, old term ter- terminology, uh, which is your your enclosure where you're keeping this bird in, and that's the dimensions and the way it's made has to meet your state regulations. But as long as long as you have that that somewhere, it could be you could live in an apartment, but at your in laws' house, you may have permission to put this facility and and have the bird safely kept there and so on. Sure. I guess that's a good um, clarification. There's always, I mean, again, it, it all depends on where you live. In my case, in Wyoming, two winters ago, we went down minus 43 degrees. So the the, the extreme cold is my problem. Mm-hmm. And so I built a facility, 2,700 square foot facility from ground up with in-floor heating. Oh, wow. So I could uh, keep these birds there safely. There are birds that are more susceptible to frostbite than others. Harris hawks are a great example. They come from the Sonoran Desert, and uh, they're, they're, they they are always on the in, in lower you know lower states, lower hotter climates. So for their sake, I needed to have a facility that I can control the temperature. And of course, all I need to do is keep it at forty degrees and above the frost line, and and I'm good. Do you have any other tips or word of advice for anybody that would like to get started in falconry? I would say um, find a falconer. Nowadays, it's much, much easier with with internet and all the searches you could do and, you know, depending on your state. But find a falconer and just go and spend time with them. Humble yourself. Make yourself available. If they need help cleaning their muse, every falconer needs help as far as cleaning stuff. I'm a breeder myself, so... If I get a phone call like that and someone says, you know, I'd like to come and help out and see how it's done, that's the right approach. I mean, I don't expect it's a even finding a sponsor. It's not something that anyone's obligated. No one's getting paid for it. So it's a it make yourself available and useful. And and that's a good way to put your foot in the door and have someone have that personal relationship with you and see your, you know, worth their time to invest into you and have you become a falconer. There are lots of people who get it in, get in there because it's just cool to have a raptor. That's not the right approach. I personally do not take on any apprentices unless I know they are going to hunt with them, um, hunt with their birds. And unless they prove themselves to be capable of taking wild game, they will not, in my under my apprenticeship, they will not be upgraded to their general so i'm very strict and my approach is that this is that it's for the conservation of the sport these birds are raptors that need to be hunted and this needs to support the long-term visual and conservation of the wildlife that we're handling and they are wild yeah i I think that's um that's absolutely true and you know it always makes me so sad i do a lot with uh poultry as well and i always see people that are posting pictures of it's usually red tails and great horns that maybe picked off one of their chickens and of course this person's upset so they want to know how they can go about trapping them or shooting them or yeah, or yeah, something sad. like that and it it's oh it just aggravates me to no end absolutely and that's what that's what that's what that education that's what that's when that education program comes in handy to just mm-hmm. make awareness to general public and they were here before us, and it's easy for us to put our fowl in a in an enclosure, chicken wire, whatever it may be, uh, and the responsibility is on you. That that poor bird's out there trying to survive the winter, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I definitely think the the conservation and education is important. So, with that being said, if somebody wants to learn more about what you're doing, or maybe they have some needs for some falcon abatement, how can they go about getting some more information and finding you online? Absolutely. We have a very uh, informative um, and very image-heavy website, and uh, that is uh, www.falconforce.com. 
we are also on Instagram uh, under Falcon Force underscore falconry. Um, also, I guess I can toot my own horn being a photographer. So it, both both sites are extremely image heavy, and uh, there's a lot of information that comes on the website, um, locations and events that we normally partake so there's a lot of information out there and there's a ton of information further on just the general internet yeah i know you have some really great pictures in the in the photography background totally makes sense and some really great videos too i enjoyed watching the videos on your website of watching your birds working fields yes and actually you said that that brought another uh, we are actually we last year we shot with uh, warner brothers in london and um, they shot for a an episode for Uh, Netflix that is going to be released somewhere after the 15th of January. I don't know the link yet, but that will be put on the website and uh, the general public can hopefully see that. Uh, Maybe not at the beginning after they have run their course and then finally we'll hopefully get get that. But there may be a little appearance of us uh, on that. We have been on uh, many publications and LA Times cover, New York Times cover and uh, Seattle Times cover. We've been on um, Mike Rose, Someone's Gotta Do It. We shot an episode with them a couple of years ago. We've been on um, Storage Wars as an apprentice, as an, not an apprentice, as an appraiser. Uh, so there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, you know, presence out there that we've been, that we've partaken. Well, that's wonderful. We definitely need to get the word out there and, and inspire some new falconers. Yeah, that's the idea. Well, but hey, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me and uh, share your information about falconry. And now you've got me all fired up. <laughs> oh, you should you should get right back into it. I know I need to. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Anytime. And for those of you listening, thank you so much for joining us for another episode. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty, a podcast by HeritageAcresMarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All of the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.